Hey, Mark 6, verse one. Read it with me. It says, then he went out from there. Then and there are important. This is a transitional chapter. It's on the heels of some events. And I think it's important contextually. But he went out from there. And then he came to his own country. This would be Nazareth. And his disciples followed him. Just stop right there. I just love this scene. Jesus is now leaving Galilee. Guys, let's go to Nazareth, my hometown. Jesus goes to his hometown. You guys ever been to your hometown before? You remember this? You walk to your home, you're like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. And everyone sees you like, you're different because you look different than the last time you were there. Jesus shows up though, and he's not just with a few disciples, not 12. I believe he has lots of people with him because he's been gathering masses. So when Jesus rolls into Nazareth, dude, not only is he different, he's now been baptized, spirit-filled, and he's walking in authority and power, and he's got a whole posse with him, a whole crew. This is a big deal, going to your hometown. I relate a little bit to this, because this is my hometown. I moved here when I was age 12, and I lived here from 12 to 19 in my formative years, and I ran from God and went to this church and was a total knucklehead. And then I moved to Ashland. I was a total knucklehead there for a couple of years until I got arrested, went to jail, and got out. I said, Lord, I'm a knucklehead. Forgive me. And God began to restore me, and I was in Ashland for 13 years. And then I got sent back to Newport 14 years ago. This is my hometown. And now to be with you guys. You guys are the posse. Here we are, man, and God's doing stuff. And I want to learn from Jesus because it's not always puppy dog tails and rainbows. Check it out. It says that when the Sabbath, verse two, had come, he began to teach in the synagogue. He went to his home church. This is where he grew up in youth group. Man, he was in the band earlier. We don't know these things, but we could assume. It says, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, whoa, where'd this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him that such mighty works are performed by his hands? Exclamation point. Just pinch yourself. Jesus, he grew up there. Everyone knows Jesus. He's the son of Mary, the son of Joseph. He's a carpenter. We know this guy. And all of a sudden, Jesus comes back, and now he's a rabbi. They're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. You go to rabbi school? What happened to you? Know where to go. You're a carpenter. And they're going to throw him under the bus in just a minute. And Jesus grabs the book, and he begins to teach. And when he's teaching, their minds are blown. They're astonished. Like, whoa, did you hear that? Nobody's ever said that. People are getting healed. It's actually kind of a cool day at church, except for verse 3. I wish verse 2 was the end. Verse 3, though. They're seeing, they're observing, and then they conclude wrongly. Look at verse three. It says, is this not the carpenter? That's a slam. The son of Mary? That's a slam. And the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And aren't his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. That word offended is the word scandalon, where we get our word scandal or scandalized. At one point, they're astonished. What? What? This is crazy. And then after a while, they're offended. You know why they're offended? Because we love being offended. It's an American pastime right now. I'm offended. You're offended? Let's be offended together. I'm offended. You're not offended. I'll offend. You know, we love being offended. What are they offended at? I don't even know. Jesus is doing crazy. He's doing miracles. But they know him. And they know him just enough. This is the world, by the way, right now. Listen. They know him just enough. Oh, yeah, we know Jesus. They know him just enough. There's just a little enough where they think they know him all the way. They think they know everything about him. This is what people do. Most people you talk to for the rest of your life, test me in this. Most people know something about Jesus Christ. Ask any single person you know in your life right now. Have you ever heard of Jesus Christ? They'll look at you like, what'd you say? Of course I have. Oh, cool. Do you think he's the Messiah? No. Everybody has some knowledge of Jesus Christ. Just a little bit, some And most people, though, if not taking that knowledge they have, the claims of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, the stories of Jesus, if they don't take that and let it change their life, they go from astonished, because everything about Jesus is astonishing, to being offended. And it it blows my mind. It boggles my mind. As a matter of fact, it does Jesus, too. They call him the carpenter. Look at verse 4. Jesus says, but Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in three places, his own country among his own relatives and his own household. Stop right there, eyes up here. You've all experienced this before when Jesus took over your life and you became spirit-filled and excited about him. You're pretty excited, right? And you go around your friends and family and relatives and they're like, oh, you'll be okay, you know? Oh, you're on a Jesus trip. Yeah, they're there, you'll be fine. (laughs) Settle down. And Jesus says, yeah, when you get filled with the spirit, everyone else outside of your hometown and area, they're fired up. There's respect there, it's excitement. You go home and man, it's not the same. This is a bummer deal, but we've all experienced it. Verse five, two more verses and we're gonna get back to the top. It says, now he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And then he marveled because of their unbelief. And then he went about the villages teaching in a circuit. First thing I wanna say is this. 
Jesus is such a champion here. He's a champion everywhere, but I wanna learn from Jesus. He just got done in chapter five. It says, then he left from there and came to his hometown. What he'd just been going through was storms and dangers at sea. Remember that? They were almost in a shipwreck. It was dangerous. And then they got to the shores of Gadara and there was demons there. That's a bad day. There are demons everywhere. Jesus deals with it. Back in the boat, they go to Galilee and they've gone from danger to demons to now disease. And there's a woman there that's had a plague for 12 years and Jesus heals her. And then Jairus' daughter dies. So there's demons and danger and disease and death. Somebody needs a vacation. (laughs) You know, it's Jesus. Doesn't he need a vacation? Maybe that's why he went home to Nazareth. I don't know, maybe he's like, dude, this is crazy. Let's go to either some good food in Nazareth. Let's go, I don't know. But when he went to Nazareth, what does he do? He just keeps preaching. He show, he's on mission. Now, again, I think we do need to rest. God's given to us the Sabbath principle. I'm not the best at resting. Pray for your pastor. But I do realize we need to rest. We need vacations. We need off times. But here Jesus is on a special mission. And so even though he's been through danger, dealing with demons, plagued by disease, and also surrounded by death, he just keeps going. That encourages me, because sometimes my life gets crazy and it gets overwhelming. Sometimes I'm tempted to tap out or to spaz out or to wig out. I don't wanna do that, I wanna keep going. Jesus shows up and he goes right to church. He brings, by the way, his posse with him. He had been radically changed. Know this, Jesus was always God. He was born God, he didn't ever become God. He was God as a little baby. Even in the womb, the immaculate conception, he's God in there, causing crazy things. John the Baptist knows he's God in his mom's womb and everybody knows he's God. But when he became 30, he found his cousin, John the Baptizer, and was baptized in the Jordan River and then received the power of the Holy Spirit and he became anointed for his mission. So when he left Nazareth, he got changed, spirit-filled, and came back different with a posse of people. Again, this is something that many of us have experienced when we leave high school and go to college and find a career and get married. There's lots of change happening in our lives. And sometimes when we come back, people don't recognize you. They might not even like you. Like, whoa, where's the old Luke for sure? You know, that's crazy. And yet Jesus, I believe, did this because he loved his hometown. This is special for me being back in Newport and being here for 14 years now and and it's my hometown. I just know God wants us here. It's so fun to be here. There's lots of things I could pick on about Newport, you know, and the weather and this and that, but God wants us here. Yesterday, the weather was super bad. We call it satanic fog at our house. So when, the, when it gets hot in the valley and the fog gets sucked in, we're like, what is this? If you drive east, just like one or two miles though, there's still salvation happening just east. And yesterday was the Toledo Summer Festival and I missed the parade and I missed the, the log throwing contest. I missed all that stuff because I was preparing for this week and I had stuff to do. But about six o'clock, I finally got to the Summer Fest. And when I got there, I was walking around. I saw all these people there partying and having so much fun and all that. But I saw so many people that I grew up with, guys and girls that I've known from high school, from high school back in 25 years ago, 30 years ago. And I stopped a few of them. I grabbed them and I said, dude, isn't this crazy that you're alive still? Like you should be dead and I should be dead. We both dealt drugs together, we did drugs, we we were bad people together. Isn't this crazy what God's done? And I was able to lay my hands on about a half dozen people yesterday, praying for them and just encouraging them. People walked away saying, this is why I came to the festival today to see you, Pastor Luke. And it was so cool to be on mission in that way in my hometown. I hope you have that same commitment when you go to Walmart or when you go to McKay's or when you go to Grocery Outlet to let the Lord use you. Look at what happens in verse two though. Jesus is just killing it here. He's a champ, I wanna be like him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue and many hearing him were astonished saying, where did this man get these things? What wisdom is this which is given to him that such mighty works are performed by his hands? Again, if verse two was a standalone verse, this would have been the day of salvation for them. I don't know how your testimony is when you became a believer in Jesus Christ, like a real born again, spirit filled believer. For me, it was when I went to the Ashland Christian Fellowship in Ashland. After I got out of jail, I went to church and I heard the word of God taught in a way I'd never heard it before. Some guy, some pastor, Andy Green, got up there and read the Bible and explained it and the Holy Spirit applied it to my life. Boom, and I was mind blown. Where did this man get this wisdom? And all, you know, and I was astonished. I hope you've had that happen. I hope every single one of you have been astonished by God's word, by Jesus Christ, by the presence of God in the spirit. I hope that's happened to you. If it hasn't, may it be today. May today be the day where you're renewed, where the Lord takes your spirit and astonishes you. By the way, not only should that happen to you through Jesus Christ like it did to them, but it also should happen to the people around you through you because it has happened to you. When God sends us out on mission, there should be some sort of effect on the people around us like there was on these people. They have the wrong conclusion. They're observing, they're, they're receiving. 
they don't like what they're receiving, that's on them. Maybe they'll get there eventually. But there should be something about your life, just like Jesus, wherever you come into the room, something changes. Maybe there's a joy increase. Maybe there's a peace increase. Maybe there's a strength increase where the spirit of God in you, the gift of God for you is not just for you, but it's for the people around you. These guys though, they blow it, they miss it, which is by the way, crazy. Sometimes people miss it when I say something to them, I'm nice to them, I share with them, I pray for them and they don't get it. And I get offended like, what the heck, dude? But here Jesus, Christ, the son of God has the same effect. He has the words of wisdom, changes some people's lives, but many people miss it. And I'll say this, it could be because familiarity has a tendency to breed contempt. When you get too familiar with something, oh, this is Jesus. Yeah, he is a little different. He definitely looks different. He sounds different. I don't think he went to rabbi school. I don't know how he's doing this, but I remember Jesus. You know, I'm very familiar with him. And so we then find ourselves contemptuous towards him if we're not careful. Look at verse three. They begin to throw him under the bus. Isn't this the carpenter? That's the first slam. Now, that's not a bad thing. If you're a carpenter, there's no, no harm, no foul. But what they're implying is this, wait a minute. He just showed up to church, grabbed a Bible, and started preaching. He's not a rabbi. He didn't go to Bible school or yeshiva. He doesn't have any spiritual training, which encourages me hugely. I didn't go to Bible college either. I don't have any spiritual training. All I have is God's call in my life and the obedience that I gave back to him and God's power and God's anointing that he gives out. And you might have excuses for your life. Well, I can't witness to my neighbors. I don't, haven't read the Old Testament, you know, and I don't understand heaven and eschatology escapes me and I don't know hermeneutics or homily. I don't know these things. Listen, just because you're a carpenter doesn't mean you don't have the anointing or the calling or you're a teacher or you're a bus driver or you're a singer or you're a fisherman. God's called us each to be witnesses. Just share what you do know. You ever get freaked out to share what you don't know? Don't, don't ever try and share what you don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about, but I'll give it a try. <laughs> don't, talk about what you do know. I was lost, now I'm found. I was dumb and now I'm not as dumb. You know, I was, I, I was lost, Jesus found, I'm different. That's a testimony. People can take it or leave it. Some people will take it, take it though. Well, he's a carpenter. Then they also slam number two. They say, isn't he the son of Mary? Now to label Jesus the son of Mary today is not a slam. We're all into that. We sing songs about it at Christmas, the son of Mary, and Mary, did you know? It's all good. In those days, first century, you would never associate somebody in their lineage to their mom. You would always associate them in their lineage to their father. This was honor in those days. It could be a dishonor to the women, but that in that, you would always say, this is the son of Joseph. But you guys know Jesus' story. Joseph wasn't his dad. And as a matter of fact, they used that against Mary and Jesus their entire young childhood. They would look at Mary and they would call her a shady lady. They would say, where did this kid even come from? You don't even know. And she'd say, the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine if your teenage daughter came home and you know, was pregnant? Like, what happened? Like, the Holy Spirit. You're like, no, you know, someone's in trouble, you know. And that was how she grew up. And so when they said, isn't this the son of Mary? The implication of is that Jesus was illegitimate in how he had been born. Now, we know, by the way, that Jesus was born of a virgin, the Virgin Mary. It's a miracle, immaculate conception. Why was it that way? All of the details surrounding Jesus' birth are miraculous. They're prophecies, they're promises. It's incredible. One of the reasons, though, Jesus was born of a virgin is very, very important. When babies are made, husbands and wives partner in that process of making a baby, and they both share some DNA factors to make that baby. And what comes from the husband, from the dad, from the man is the bloodline. The bloodline is determined through the male. And Joseph's bloodline would have been tainted. It would have been sinful because he was a sinful man that came from the line of Adam. And so if he were there making the baby Jesus, Jesus' blood would have been tainted from conception. But instead, Jesus had no earthly father. He had a heavenly father. Jesus was born, the only person ever besides Adam and Eve, born with perfect blood in his body. No sin, no fails, no flaws. And then he went on to live that way, sin-free the rest of his life and die as a sinner in our place. The Lamb of God that takes away our sins. Crazy. Well, this was a slam. They're making fun of him. Isn't he just a carpenter? Wait, wait, wait. This is Mary's son, the illegitimate guy. And brother, and his brothers are here. James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. Jesus had many brothers and even some sisters that are not named. His sisters are here with us, so they were offended at him. Side note, there are certain religions and beliefs that say that the Virgin Mary birthed Jesus and then stayed a virgin the rest of her, uh, her life. She, that's impossible if you're gonna have like six or seven more kids. So she wasn't a virgin. I think the, the Catholics kind of blew it in that one based on this verse right here. But it says that they were offended. 
And let me just pick on them for a second. I've already done so. They had Jesus right there. He was doing mighty things. They were observing everything accurately. And instead of becoming believers, like my shirt says, they were unbelievers. It's actually kind of crazy. I bought this shirt online like three days ago and it came in the mail real fast. And I put it on today and it says believe. And I was like, wait, that's actually the whole theme of the message today. Are you gonna believe? Are you really gonna believe? Chapter six is all about belief and unbelief. There are six separate scenes, we're not gonna get there today, where people unbelieve. They don't believe. His disciples don't, his acquaintances don't, his enemies don't. They don't believe in Jesus. And all he's asking for you and for me is to simply believe. Because faith and believing, believing is the key, unbelieving is the killer. And if you wanna be different in your life moving forward, all you have to do is simply believe. These guys though, they were offended instead. It's easy to pick on them, it's fun to pick on them. Let me pick on us for just a minute. The reason they did this again, I'm just going to guess, was because of familiarity. They knew Jesus, he's the carpenter, Mary's son, his brothers, his sisters, what the heck, this is dumb. And they didn't want to go deeper because they thought they knew everything. Now here's the temptation. You and I showed up to church today, it was awesome, okay? And we're gonna, we're gonna sing, we, we sang, we took communion. We do this, it, you, it can actually become very familiar. You, Pastor Luke's teaching, it's kind of cool. And, and we're having a good time. And you're gonna, we're gonna end soon. Some of you are like, I better end sooner than later. We're gonna end soon. We're gonna go on our way. And we're, gonna, and we're gonna keep doing it. And if you're not careful, the things of God can, even for you and me, become so familiar that even we become offended at the things of God. Maybe not as bad as they were, but it might not be as special as it once was. We see this in relationships and friendships. If you've ever met somebody very interesting or very intriguing, like, oh my gosh, this person's so fun to be around. This is so great. This is awesome. And after a while, if you're not careful, it becomes very familiar. And even if they're an amazing person, it kind of wears off if you're not careful. And if that contempt grows in your heart, I would just say, pinch yourself. May we always be those Christians who are so soft, so willing, so wanting the Lord to have his way and to do a new work every single day. I don't want to grow hardened or offended at the things of God. Easy to pick on them, but I wanna make sure I shine the light back in my own face just a little bit, and not make excuses for myself. Look at how Jesus handles this, verse four. It says, but Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. That's kind of a poetic sentence. It's kind of like a mouthful too, but I'm gonna be honest, it's sad. Jesus was dealing with rejection at his hometown. I don't know how you process rejection. Each one of us process it a little differently. I've had to process a lot of rejection over the years being in the ministry and just being who I am, my personality. I don't process it very well. I like everyone to like me. I like everyone to be my best friend. And when I find out somebody misunderstood me or doesn't, under, doesn't like me, I'm like, what? And it gets to me. I can find myself disappointed. And Jesus here deals with it. He says, a prophet's not without honor except in this, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, doesn't go the same in my hometown or, or my home church or, or where I'm at, I feel rejected. I say all that to say this, Jesus understood more than you, more than me, rejection. He understood loneliness. He understood what it was like to hurt and he didn't cry about it, he didn't stop, he kept going and I wanna follow in my master's footsteps and I wanna even look at the truth. You think he said the red letters here to fill up space? Or was he just dealing with the reality? This life's broken. He's the Messiah. He's God in the flesh. And they just threw him under the bus. Oh, carpenter. Oh, Mary's son. They're making fun of him. This would have hurt. You can harden your heart and get calloused and make fun of people back. I think Jesus is just, he's dealing with it. We need to deal with it as well. Look what happens though. Not only did Jesus deal with it well, but the, uh, the collateral damage though was not good. Verse five, it says, now he could do no mighty work there except that he laid hands on a few sick people and he healed them. Stop right there, eyes up here. A few sick people got healed because Jesus is teaching and sharing and they're like, I'll take some of that. Like pray for me. And Jesus like, really? You believe? He's like, I believe. And Jesus prayed for him and they got healed. There were some believers there, the ones that were really desperate. But the rest of the people, they weren't wanting miracles. And so you know what they got? No miracles. No move of God, no revelation, no insight, no gifts were given. And you might say, why didn't Jesus just give it to them? Why didn't he dump it on their face and make it happen and boom and prove it to them? Because God's a gentleman. I'm gonna say it this way, and this is gonna hopefully convict you and challenge you the rest of your life. Your attitude towards God determines your altitude to God. How close are you to God right now? How close are you to God at any given time? Are you really close or kind of distant? 
We could blame a lot of factors, a lot of variables. I'm gonna say it simply though. It's your attitude that determines your altitude. If I don't wanna be soft, if I don't wanna be kind, if I don't wanna be spiritual, if I don't wanna pray, if I don't wanna read, I don't wanna sing, I don't wanna serve, guess what? I don't have to. I don't have to do any of that stuff. And my altitude's real low. Why is the Lord so distant from me? Why am I so weird right now? What's happening? I don't know, what have you been doing? <laughs> Not the things I should be doing. But if you, want, if you seek, ask and knock, if you stay hungry, stay thirsty, how are we gonna do that? Don't get offended. Stop being offended. Instead, say, Lord, take me right, I'm, Lord, I'm sick. Lord, I need help right now. Can you, can you, Lord, I believe. Lord, I'm a believer, really. And the Lord is drawn to believers. Would you believe that the Lord, as much as he loves people, he's the shepherd that goes after the sheep, would you believe that God is repelled by unbelief? He's repelled by it. Oh, you don't believe? Oh, you're an unbeliever? Hmm. Interesting. And the Lord is actually, but he's drawn to believers. And a Calvinist might argue with me or somebody else at this point, but it says right here in verse five that God could not do many mighty things because of their unbelief. They were the ones setting the tone. They were the ones determining what was going to happen. Now, a Calvinist would say, God can do whatever he wants to do. He's sovereign in all things and you can't stop him or impact him one way or the other. Well, it says it right here. He couldn't do mighty works because they didn't want him to. I would also say this. I'm gonna speak on the other side. Some churches overdevelop this principle and say that if we have enough faith, God will do whatever we want him to do. And... And the reason God didn't do what he was asked to do is because you didn't have enough faith. And don't go that route either. But I would say this, God is drawn to belief. He responds to belief. Belief is a key. Unbelief is a killer. God can actually work with very little belief. God can actually work with no belief, but I don't believe God can work with unbelief. Even if you're just neutral, I don't know, I don't know. God, God, will, God is good. And he'll work. But if you become an unbeliever, I just don't think God loves me. I don't think he forgives me. I don't think he wants to use me. I, don't think, I just don't believe these things. Chances are that's the altitude you're gonna be flying at. Real, real low. Your life's not gonna be spectacular. There's nothing great gonna be going on because you've disallowed the Lord to use you and to prove his power in your life. It's crazy. I wanna be the guy or the gal that shows up to the fight and says, let's watch God win. Yeah, like David did. David got to the Philistine camp. And he's like, let's go giant soup for dinner it's gonna be great you know and everyone's looking I'm like dude have you seen how big the giant is like yeah it's legit you know he's eating popcorn waiting for someone to take him out and Saul's all scared well no one can take him out he's too big and David says you mind if I do it that'd be so sick wouldn't that be rad if we had that childlike faith God's gonna do it he's gonna do it his way he's not gonna do it your way don't get twisted but I believe that this is important that God wants to do in our lives many things that he's not been allowed to do simply because we're not allowing him to take us through the process of letting him do these things. Like I said, some sick people here, they got healed. They had power poured out to them. Look at verse six. It says, and he marveled because of their, what's that word? Unbelief. And then he went about the villages in a circuit teaching. Stop right there. I up here two points out of that uh, verse. Jesus is marveling. I don't know what that word means, really. Like, mar what's it mean when you're mar? Like, whoa. Whoa. In the scriptures, Jesus only marveled twice. Only twice. Now, he had gone to the temple one time, and the disciples said, hey, Jesus, have you seen the temple? It is sick. And he's like, oh, yeah, temple, temple, temple. Oh, there it is. Yeah, 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 no big deal. He didn't marvel at it. It was a spectacle. 150 years, King Herod the Great made it. It was big time. Jesus didn't even notice it. Jesus traveled the world. He went to Caesarea Philippi, crazy areas. Jesus didn't even trip out about anything he saw except twice in the scriptures. Whoa, he marvels. Once here in Nazareth when people didn't believe. And he's like, whoa, you for real don't believe? And it, it freaked him out. It caught his attention. That's crazy. I've been teaching, sharing, healing, and you're not a believer? Mar and he marveled. The other time Jesus marveled was the opposite. When one day a centurion, a Roman guard, a Gentile approached him and said, Jesus, my servant is sick. Can you heal him? And Jesus got up and said, yeah, let's go. And the guy said, whoa, 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 stop right there. He said, you don't need to come to my house. I'm a Gentile. I'm a man of authority. When I tell people to go, they go. You're a man of authority. You just tell my servant to be healed from here and he'll be healed. And Jesus marveled and said, are you? You think I can just say, be healed and he'll be healed? And the guy's like, yeah, I believe that. And Jesus said, I haven't seen this type of faith in all of Israel. And if Roman Gentile has more, this, he's freaking out. He's, this is marvelous. 
here's the question. Which way today do you feel that the Lord is marveling about you? About your faith? Is he marveling? Is he up in heaven right now grabbing his best friends? Hey, guys, come here. Check this out. This is crazy. Look at South Beach Church. Check out what they're doing. These guys are nuts. Look what they're doing. They believe. They think it's actually happening. They think I'm going to fulfill my promises. They think I'm coming back again soon. They've read the book, and they believe. Isn't this crazy? Jesus grabbing all his best buddies, looking over. The Bible says that the angels desire to peer into the things of earth like, wow, this is crazy. What kind of faith do you have right now? Is it a marvelous faith where the Lord and all of heaven's peering into it? And I pray, and that's not uh, meant to put a trip on you or to mess with you in any way, but I wanna make sure that I run my race in such a way where the Lord looks at me and says, hey, thanks for having faith, Luke. Thanks for believing. And there's days, weeks, and months, and years where you can't see anything. All you're doing is the next right thing. You don't know how it's gonna work out. It's not always fun. It's not always easy. It's actually rarely fun and never easy. Faith. Faith is a muscle that you work, and it's not a pill you take. It's something you gotta keep working and maybe you had faith for a minute, but then you got tired. I prayed for a, a pastor at the second service, came up front for, for prayer, and he said, I'm just a burned out pastor, pray for me. And I prayed for him that he would cast off that burned outness. And just because he's older, that he would remember the things that God's doing. It has nothing to do with your age or your resources. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that I'm gonna say suck. Wouldn't that suck if it had to do with your age or resources? Like, how strong are you? I'm like, not very. You got anything? No. It's like, you have faith? Yes. You know, okay, good. It has nothing to do with you. All to do with the promises of God. Well, Jesus here, he marveled. Look what Jesus' response is. We're gonna speed it real quick. It says, then he went about the villages in a circuit teaching. Again, Jesus here, I'm not gonna say had a bad day, but this was kind of weird. He shows up to Nazareth, it doesn't go well. What's Jesus do? He keeps going. He's gonna keep preaching. This is a good word for you Sunday school teachers, for you moms and dads with some weird kids, okay? Life group leaders and it didn't go well for you. Maybe stuff's tough for you, it's not going. Here's Jesus, he's coming up, coming up empty, swinging a miss. Really, a couple of people got saved. There's no real miracles, that's what it says. What's Jesus say? Let's keep going, next city. I love that mentality. Man, you can't stay down. You gotta keep going. Reminds me of Reggie Jackson, the baseball player. He's number 20 in home runs for the whole entire world. He's like number, top 20 in the home runs for Major League Baseball on the record list, but he also is number one in the Baseball World Hall of Fame for strikeouts. Can you imagine having the most strikeouts in the career of any baseball player ever? Like, hey, Reggie, you just struck out. He's like, I'm still top 20 home runs. <laughs> like, how do you get to be top 20 home runs? Swing at everything. And when you go down swinging, go back and try it again. Anyways, Jesus keeps going. Guys, let's switch gears real quick because it says here in verse seven, and he called the 12 to himself and he began to send them out two by two. Oh, and he gave them power over unclean spirits. Stop right there, eyes up here. Jesus now, maybe on the heels, maybe in response to this Nazareth thing, I don't know, said, okay, we're gonna switch it up a little bit. We're gonna switch it up. Now, instead of me driving the bus and me doing all the talking, I'm gonna have us divide up in pairs of twos and you guys are gonna go out and evangelize and win the world. Okay, you ready for that? Now, if you're on the voting committee, how many of you guys are gonna vote that Jesus keeps driving the bus and does all the talking? Like, how, that, Jesus, you're so cool, dude. He's driving, he does all the talking. We just get to see there, you know, and Jesus is like, okay, we're doing it differently. Two by two. Why two by two? It doesn't say, but we know it's wise. In the, in the council of two witnesses, a testimony was confirmed. Uh, two are better than one. Sometimes when you're with another person, you're not feeling great or you're down, the other person's oftentimes strong and there's companionship in that way. Sometimes if you're both feeling strong, the strength is multiplied, not even times two, but by times 10 because there's strength in numbers. There's accountability. If you go out two by two, let's say that there's some fruit that comes up, not one person can take that fruit. There's all kinds of reasons here. Jesus here gives us this model. Then he makes it very simple. Look at verse eight. He commanded them to take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bag, no bread, no copper in their money belts, but to wear sandals and not to wear two tunics. Stop right there, eyes up here. The instructions are very clear, but they're also very simple. Don't wear multiple pairs of clothes. Okay, don't pack a big old bag. Okay, you don't need a bunch of stuff. You do need shoes. Put your sandals on. And I believe this is because Jesus wants us to finish our race. He wants us to go until we get to the end. You're gonna need shoes because this is a long journey. Don't give up halfway through because your feet hurt. Put your shoes on. Don't pack a bag. Don't worry about the money. Don't worry about the bread. How many of you guys, when you're going on a trip like this, like you're gonna worry about the bread and the money? <laughs> like, like, where are we going? I'm gonna bring some bread and money. He's like, don't do it. Okay. 
And he says, you can bring your staff. I'm like, oh, my staff. So I get to bring Pastor Rory and Pastor Tobias and Pastor Esai and Sarah, Katrina. You can bring the staff. He's like, no, not that staff, just your stick. Oh, stick, you know. I just think that Jesus is saying here and modeling, and I don't think this is supposed to be modeled for our ministries moving forward, but the principle is keep it simple because the Lord is gonna do what the Lord's gonna do, and it's not about your resources or your ingenuity or your abilities, but you gotta go out in obedience. And what do you have? A staff would be good for walking, but it's so synonymous with Moses when he was called, and Moses started making excuses. Well, I can't talk, and I'm scared of the dark, and I went to bed, all these you know, things that Moses had. I made that last part up, but he had all these excuses, and God's like, whoa, 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 what do you have? And he said, well, I got a stick. He's like, okay, well, bring your stick. Bring your stick and use your stick. And he used the stick for everything. He put the stick in the water, he hit the rock, he hold it up. Everywhere the stick went, it became known as the rod of God. It was a big deal. It's just a stick. What do you have? This is so cool to take inventory. You could read Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. Those are the gifts. Uh, those are the lists that are, those are the gifts that are listed in the scriptures, the spiritual gifts that God gives to us gifts of ministry and gifts of mercy, gifts of counseling and wisdom and teaching and serving. There's all kinds of gifts. We're all gifted differently. You might have a gift that's very different than my gift. You might not have any gifts that you're aware of. Read the scriptures and just go in the flow that the Lord would lead you to do it for his glory. I love how it says he sent them out two by two with power. This is important. I'm leaving today in just a few minutes. Gonna go, <laughs> I'm laughing at my schedule. Gonna go to Portland and drive there and I need to do that in the power of God. I can actually do it in God's power. I can't in my own, okay? Red Bull's gonna help just a little bit too, but I can, in, in God's power, I can do it in the joy of the Lord. I don't wanna have fear in my life. I don't wanna be in over my head where I can't handle it because everything I'm doing in my life is in over my head. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And I get overwhelmed and I get in weird moods sometimes, but I really am not afraid. I just don't find value in being afraid because I know God is bigger than any fears that I have. I know God's given me enough power to overcome and to get through anything that I find myself dealing with. That doesn't mean my life's easy, it's very difficult. Usually I make it more difficult for myself. But I can continue to keep going forward. He's given us power, lean on that power, trust in that power, rely on that power, teach your kids about that power. Don't go anywhere without that power. Greater is he who's in you than he who's in the world. Jesus gives them this incredible power. Then he says this, he gives them some instructions. I'm gonna have Pastor or Paul Jones come up and lead us in a closing song. We're gonna respond, I'm just gonna read this quickly. He said then in verse 10, in whatever place you enter a house, stay there until you depart from that place. And whoever will not receive you nor hear you when you depart from there, shake off the dust from under your feet. It's a testimony against them. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Interesting, a couple of things that Jesus points out here. He says, hey, when you go to someone's house or go to someone's church or someone's ministry, commit to it. Commit to it why I release you. Don't just hop around, find the latest, coolest thing, find a life group, find a church, find a ministry, and even though it's difficult, stay there and make it work for God's glory and for others' good until I tell you otherwise. And if they don't receive you, if it just ends poorly, <laughs> shake it off. Don't worry about it. I don't wanna develop this thought too much, but I will point it out. Jesus does say that that city that doesn't receive you, it's gonna be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah. It didn't go well for them. More tolerable for them than for the city that rejects the gospel of Jesus. Let me just say this simply. Not everyone is into the final judgment that's coming. Some people have actually tried to erase that out of the Bible. There's no judgment. There's no way God's gonna do that. Jesus here literally said, it's coming down. And here's what he said to you and me. You don't need to be the judge. Shake it off. There will be people that reject you, reject me, reject our church. They're gonna reject the Bible, okay? And I can get personally mad. I can get frustrated. Jesus, oh, no, 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 don't do that, Luke. Let them go. I'll judge them because I'll do it in righteousness and in mercy. You'll, you'll judge them wrongly. You'll be a weirdo, and it's not good for you to judge people, Luke. So, so two things, don't be a judge. But number two, there is a day of judgment. It needs to be considered. God will hold everyone accountable. There will be a day where the scales are pulled out. And there'll be a balance. Were you a believer? Or were you an unbeliever? Guys, this mission is crazy. It's so important. Verse 12, it says this. It says, so they went out and they preached that people should repent. I'm so proud of these guys. I don't think they had a choice. Jesus is like, this is what we're doing now. Two by two, grab some sandals and some shoes. Hey, Peter, you got too many jackets off. Take one of those off. Hey, Thomas, unpack your bag. What are you bringing that for? Oh, you know. And the Bible says in verse 12, they did it. They did it. They weren't just hearers, they were, they were doers. They had Jesus, they had to do it. I think you guys are doers also. You wanna do it, I wanna do it. Jesus, I wanna do it. What do you want me to do? I'll do it. 
The scriptures are so clear in the commands and directives to love unconditionally, to forgive freely, to commit for the long haul to your spouse, to just do it, to work it out, to let the Lord search your heart. These guys did what they were asked to do. It says in verse 13, final verse, and they cast out many demons and they anointed with oil many who were sick and they healed them. Wouldn't this have been a radical mission trip? Two guys that probably didn't know each other that well. According to the scriptures, we know they probably didn't even like each other, <laughs> these disciples. They got teamed up with this guy, oh, you're with me? All right, whatever. And then they went out and prayed for people and people were healed, lives were changed. I say that because as I look at our coast, I played a quick video of the building that's going up. I don't know how it's all gonna look. I, I'm not that smart. I go out at the property and I see it coming, I'm, it's developing and things change every week. I'm like, that's crazy. I didn't know that was gonna happen. People ask me, hey, look, they ask me questions. I'm like, I don't know. I'm just a volunteer. I just show up every day. It's awesome. But I do know God's promises in his heart for this community that we're on mission right now. And it's very important that the return of the Lord is so near. It's nearer now than it has ever been. And the enemy is so good at letting us waste our days. He's so good at sneaking into our mind and setting traps for each one of us. He's so good. The spiritual warfare is so heavy right now. And God wants us to be focused and to be available to him and to do the next right thing and to simply trust that what God asks you to do, he's going to anoint with power. He's going to anoint with purpose. If you don't believe these things, you need to. I have to believe these things. I have no other choice. I'm going to ask you guys to stand up and pray with me. We're going to sing this song of worship. And if you need prayer during this song, I'd love to lay my hands on you and anoint you with prayer, stir up those gifts in you. But I pray that God's word would go into your heart and you would grab it and say, let's do this, Jesus. Let's do this. Don't go home the same way you came in. Don't go out those doors, the same man or the same woman you were before you got here. You need to be spirit filled. You need to be anointed, rebuked and rebuilt together. Maybe some trees cut down in your life. Maybe some ditches filled in with the power of the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, let's pray. Father, in Jesus name, would you search our hearts and would you do a miracle that only you can do of restoration, of deliverance, of guidance, Lord, of renewal of vows, both horizontal and vertical, that we would be the men and women you want us to be for such a time as this. And maybe you've grown asleep. Maybe you've been distracted. Maybe you just got all beat up by the things of this world and you forgot you were even in a race. But if you need the Holy Spirit right now to come upon you, to anoint you to be the man or woman you're supposed to be, to fill you right now, and you want to believe, you want to go deeper, you don't want to be astonished and then offended. Instead, you want to, like Jesus, marvel at the things of God. And if you need his help to do that, but you want it, you want to believe it, would you just raise up your hands right now? Nobody's looking. Just raise up your hands and say, yes, Lord, I want all that you have. I don't just want to play games. I don't want to blow it with the short years that I have left, Lord. I want to go all in. Holy Spirit, that's my, conf uh, my confession to you and my request. You'd fill me, fill my cup, Lord, to the point of overflowing, Lord. And may we go to that spout where the blessings come out. Even now, Lord, as we pray to you and worship you, would you be honored in what we do? We need you, Jesus, and it's in your name we pray. And everybody said... Let's worship the Lord together. If you need prayer, come up front.